Good to see everyone. Good to see everyone, and uh, welcome to the Monday night Bible study. And welcome to our internet uh, prayer warriors, brothers and sisters across America and the world. And may God bless you for joining us. And we know that there's quite a family of you that do that. Uh, I would suggest it would bless us real good in Bradenton if you would write us and let us hear from you so that we can um, begin to, uh, well, let's get acquainted. Um, and the address of our church, I believe, can be put on the screen. Is it's it? it's on YouTube and Facebook and every place. Yeah, it's on Facebook. Phone number, or address. Pick it up without any yeah. problem. We'd like to hear from you. And uh, if you're interested in the gospel that we teach and believe, <coughs> preach, um, and you feel it is gospel, it is the word of God, then we would, we would like to hear from you. And uh, we, we would like to just uh, have that encouragement to know that you, you're there. Let us pray before we do anything, or as always, anyone. And uh, we repeat many times over and again certain ones, but sometimes I just like to pray for everyone. Uh, that may be in need, and um, because that's God is going to be the uh, provider. Uh, I did uh, know the brethren have brother Farius for the last uh, brethren in the university, and I did today. I stepped in the hospital at Manatee, and <laughs> I had not seen uh, Sister Noel, uh, Sister Edna's daughter, uh, and uh, she really touches your heart. Uh, she's in dire need of prayer. She's in dire need of God helping her, answering her needs, because if not, uh, her life couldn't be lengthy upon the earth in the condition that she's in. Um, Noel is a uh, third generation um, person in our church. Her grandparents came, her mother came, and she came as a little girl here. And uh, she has had 52 surgical operations. And her body is just uh, depleted from excessive surgery. And uh, uh, she's building up fluid in tonight. She was uh, <coughs> building up in her lungs and, and uh, so she needs the hand of the Lord to touch her. I want to remember Brother Wallace's mother continually also Sister Nina. Uh, I know that is she in the rest home now Brother Wallace over there? Yeah. Well I know that Brother Wallace is touched deeply by I know he loves his mother very much <coughs> and she loves him loves her children. We love Sister Nina. She's uh, become a real part of our family, family of God. And uh, didn't start out that way at the beginning, but through the years, she drew closer to the Lord. Always a godly woman, always lived a good life. I don't remember anything but good reports about her as a young woman and a provider and mother and a worker, very loyal to her husband and family. Uh, and she loves the Lord, loves the Lord. Nina, uh, her, her married name was Warmack, is that right? <coughs> yes. I think of her as Wallace. Wallace, yeah. I never got used to that other name. But, all right, and I'm going to pray for and Amen. pray about Sister Sheila Cobb in the loss of her um, husband uh, who passed away this morning about 4 o'clock. She left service early yesterday to be with him, and uh, our phone rang about 4, wasn't it, um, at the house, and she was 
telling us that he had went on with him with the Lord. And so I appreciate the church um, sent food to, out to the house today and for the parish went out a couple of times. I went by once and nevertheless did. So uh, she's been well looked after, but as far as we know right now, there'll be a memorial service here at one o'clock um, Thursday. That's the word we have when that's subject to change. But there will be a memorial service here at the church at one on Thursday for those who have care to attend and show sympathy to Sister Sheila, loss of her husband. We get any further news on that to let you know. All right, praise God. Um, keep in mind that, uh, you know, God is doing a good work among us, and it's a great day to be living in. It's a great hour to praise the Lord in, to give Him glory and honor, because He is still our great, great, wonderful Savior. So we're going, to, we're going to appreciate all of you being here tonight. We'll get into the Word. And um, <coughs> it's a class. You're free to ask questions. Uh, everything I say, you may not agree with. And everything you say, I may not agree with. Uh, it's a Bible class. And we want to, the one thing that is the hallmark of the, this church is the love and liberty. The love of God for each other liberty for the saints to express themselves and yet uh, try to be one but if, if there is a, a diversity they would still stay together we pray together we go on serving the Lord together the path we have shared um, that, that's the hallmark of the church is to show the love of God even though the way that you're approaching a subject or I may be that it may not be the exact way you heard it, that you learned it, that you feel it's right, but as long as it's in biblical order and uh, not absolute heresy uh, that, that we would hear and we would be able to reason. Even uh, God said to Israel, come let us reason together. Uh, and we're to give a reasonable answer, the Apostle Peter said, of the hope that lieth in us. So come with us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow, crimson, they shall be wool. Praise God. So can we pray? Can we pray? Father, I thank you. 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 I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. I praise you, Lord. I praise you, Lord. I praise you, Lord. I give you the glory. I give you the honor. I give you the praise. I know tonight that, Lord, you are above all in all too long. And I know that tonight in this prayer meeting, Lord, we see in our Bible study that you are with us and that you love us and that we are sisters and brothers and the Lord. We are called to be sons of God without rebuke. We are to shine as the sun and we are to always know that any darkness that comes, we can rise above it. We can be victors and not victors. We can have victory in any crisis. We can stand above any enemy. We can be strong in the Lord, in the power of His might. We know that despite our fruit and our imperfections, Lord, we know that You are the giver of life. You are the healer of the soul, the mind, the spirit, and the body. Lord, that if we come to you, we will not be turned away. You will hear us, and you will see us, and you will know us. And Lord, we know that if we come, and as the scripture tells us, that if the door is shut in the hour of midnight, uh, we will knock. And there is bread in the house. And Lord, we know that because of our infertility, uh, we will receive the bread. 
we know we can receive oh, bread. Jesus, you said, I am the bread of life. <coughs> your fathers and man in the wilderness, they're dead. But if this is the living bread, if you eat of this living bread, you'll live and never die. And we believe that you are that living bread. You're our Passover. You're the most wanted in the holy place. You're the Father and the Son. Bring the sweetness of your glory in our midst, Lord. Pray to the Lord that we're going to church. Lord, there will be unity. We're going to receive. There will be healing. There will be deliverance. There will be goodness. There will be joy and energy and peace. Lord, remove the leprosy of the sins of the world from the church. Let the church be separate, sanctified, holy, set apart. And I believe today that you see Sheila's heart, Lord, comfort her in the loss of her husband on this earth. And then comfort in the resurrection. Lord, we pray for Noel Wade tonight in the hospital in this terrible, terrible state she's in. We pray for the rest of the people in the hospital, for the nurses and the doctors who are there. Lord, we pray for the aged of the church and for those that can no longer get about with ease. And we pray for those that are going through struggles and those that might be trying to endure to the end that they can be saved. Now, Jesus, we give you the praise. We give you the glory. We give you the honor. Go with us. Guide our words. Guide our thoughts. And let this be a blessed night of study in the Word. Breaking the bread of life, Lord. And we thank you for it. We praise you for it. We worship you. We give you the glory. We approach you with humble hearts and a broken spirit. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Say praise the Lord. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. The Lord has uh, been always, always, I speak with uh, trepidation and carefulness when I say the Lord speaks to me. Um, I do not take that lightly, and uh, I don't believe every time that people would use that phrase, and I'm not judging anyone individual, but I can't believe that the Lord speaks that freely to some and says nothing hardly to others. Uh, but um, I do, as a pastor of the church, I have a great burden on my heart for the church. Um, Sister Marlow and I live, uh, we've given the years we have to this place, and we don't regret a mile that we've come to serve the Lord or to be here and bear the burden of keeping the church. Um, but uh, even more so today than <coughs> 56 years ago when I came here, I think it's more intense now that we would see it culminate, um, gravitate toward what it should be in God, in the Word, and not just become a free-for-all to where uh, anyone could say, do anything without the Scriptures, without God's condoning it from the Word. Uh, that there be no shallow thing about the church, that it have depth, it have, uh, that people can trust in the Word, trust in the um, moving of the Spirit, <clears throat> trust in the anointing, trust in the order of the church uh, that we say is of God. Um, and there's only two orders, and that's the order of man, which Satan rules through that, and a carnal mind, and the order of God, where we're partakers of his divine nature. Yeah. Uh, so we, we have to uh, be on one of those two wavelengths at all times. 
um, in, interpreting the word, preaching the word, publishing the word. The scriptures have, have said, how beautiful are the feet of them that publish the gospel of glad tidings. How beautiful, or the Paul would use that phrase, he said, how beautiful are the feet, that's the foundation of them that publish uh, the glad tidings, <coughs> the gospel, good news. It should be beautiful. The word should be beautiful. The, the church should be beautiful. And to, uh, the Lord is dealing with my spirit in that area. Um, I was talking to Brother uh, Richard, you know, I'll, I'll share it with you. There's a term, Mishnah, uh, M-I-S-H-N-A, if you don't catch my phrase, uh, Mishnah. It's a Jewish term. Mm -hmm. And uh, it means the oral law of God. Um, and there's a group of the uh, priesthood of Israel, uh, those that use the Talmud, uh, those uh, that uh, came to be known as the Pharisees, the Sadducees, um, they became very, very good at using the Mishnah. Uh, it wasn't the law of Moses. It wasn't Moses' exact <coughs> law. It was the interpretation of that law. And uh, they used it to build the, sect, the sects of the Pharisees, the sects of the Sadducees, the Essenes, um, the Herodians, um, the Stoics, uh, the Epicureans, um, they, they used it to establish their reason for existing, the interpretation of supposedly God's law. And they said that Moses received an oral law as well as a written law in Sinai. But the scriptures doesn't say that. And it's very easy to say something that the scriptures doesn't say. Um, because uh, the Mishnah became very prominent in Israel and is today uh, among the different uh, orders of the priesthood in which they interpret the law, but it's not the law. Well, that's been carried over in the Christian and also that interpretation rules more than scripture does in many, many of our churches and many of our preaching, much of our preaching in, the, in what we term the church, where the, the Mishnah or the oral interpretation of the law, uh, but it isn't scripture. It's the interpretation of the scripture. And many people feel they have the right to interpret the scripture as they see it. This is, this is not correct. This is not right. Uh, and the church will remain confused and divided as long as iron does not sharpen iron. Scripture proves scripture. Yeah. Um, see, if I prove scripture by interpretation, but I have no scripture to prove that interpretation, if scripture does not prove scripture, then that interpretation can be mine, or yours, or theirs, uh, but not the interpretation of the word, the written word. Uh, and, and so I've been studying that uh, a lot. How can we move the church back into the foundation? Because any house without a proper foundation is going to collapse at some time or another. Um, and many movements have collapsed because of interpretation and not because of strictly staying with the scripture. Uh, many churches have, many men's ministry has, because uh, they, they, uh, they, they didn't, uh, many people have backslidden, individually backslidden away from God uh, out of the church because they interpreted the scripture, but they did not have scripture to back their interpretation. They had their interpretation, um, but it, so I, I'm searching 
for a foundation. Um, I, I'm looking to see then, I'm watching the church I have been minister of here 56 years. Has it moved from the original foundation that God gave me in the beginning from the word when I came here? If I establish the church, whichever minister should, on the foundation of scripture, has that church moved? Has that church departed? Have I departed? In my ministry, my preaching, my teaching, uh, have I departed? Has the congregation departed uh, from uh, the, the original foundation, which should have been based on scripture? Um, so I'm searching to see uh, where, where we may have or might have, and as a result, when Israel departed from their foundation, they were not blessed. When, uh, and um, well, let's look at Moses a little bit here before I get into the word foundation. Go over to uh, Deuteronomy. Uh, the word Deuteronomy means second law. Uh, Deuteronomy was a repeating of Exodus and Leviticus. Uh, it was it was a second law, and um, it, it was. But look at the way Moses, just as he's getting ready to die and go up to the mountain. Uh, I'll just take, take one of the chapters where uh, he deals with this. Um, let's take, um, um, let's, let's take a, a, a 28th chapter, I believe would be a good one. Uh, and and, and uh, look, look at the 28th chapter, just a, verse, a few verses. Uh, Moses warned them and he was getting ready to die and turn the kingdom over to Joshua. Uh, and uh, 28, uh, Deuteronomy 28 and 1, and it shall come to pass if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe and to do all his commandments. See, the commandments of God, not the interpretation of God. See, that's where people get into trouble. They interpret God and they say, I'm right. That's absolutely right, that's the way it is. <clears throat> and, and, uh, and, and as a result, they, uh, they, we've had uh, the various divisions of Pentecostalism, Protestantism, uh, Catholicism, um, you know, and different divisions, separation because of interpretation, but Moses said to Israel, he said, uh, to observe and to do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. So it's the commandments of God that exalts the nation. Uh, sin is a reproach to any people, uh, but uh, righteousness exalts a nation. I command thee this day that the Lord thy God will set thee on the high of all nations. Verse 2, and all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. Uh, blessed shall thou be in the city and blessed shall thou be in, in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of thy body and the fruit of thy ground, the fruit of thy cattle, the increase of thy kind, and the flocks of thy sheep. Now he goes on and just repeats himself um, about the different ways that God would bless them. And he continues this on down, let me see, we're in the 12th verse there, he still, he goes to the 15th verse. And in the 15th verse of Deuteronomy 28, um, he said, but it shall come to pass if thou wilt not hearken, wilt not hearken, see, unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe to do all the commandments of the statutes, which I command thee this day. And all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Cursed shall thou be in the city, cursed shall thou be in the field, cursed shall be the basket and the store, the fruit of the body and the fruit of the land. <clears throat> Verse 18, the increase of thine kind, the flocks of thy sheep, See, 
there was a blessing and there was a curse based on the commandment. If they kept the commandment and if they uh, didn't depart from keeping the commandment, there was a blessing. If they departed, there was a curse. So it's very important, the foundation, uh, the scripture said, if the foundation be destroyed, what shall the righteous do? See, the foundation is a very important part of any church, anywhere, any congregation, any group of people. Um, the foundation, what does that, what, what is the foundation of the church? All right, then we'll go into scriptures dealing with the foundation. Um, let us um, go to Isaiah 28, 16. Now, you know, as I go through this, if I say, or if you get a thought, or you want to, and we'll, we'll, it's a teaching class, and it's discussion, and it's, um, we learn from one another. And so, um, let's go to Isaiah 28, uh, because um, that, that's a very good scripture there uh, to use. Isaiah 28, chapter, I believe it's verse uh, 16 or so, uh, and, and, uh, here in the 28 chapter verse um, yeah by verse 16 therefore thus saith the Lord God behold I lay in Zion I place in Zion I lay in Zion for a foundation of a stone now here he lays in Zion Zion is the church in the Old Testament, Zion was Israel. In the New Testament, Zion is the church. Um, I lay in Zion, I place in the church a foundation, a stone for a foundation, a stone. Well, what kind of stone? A tried stone. That's why that couldn't be Peter, James, or John, because in the beginning, they were not tried. So they couldn't be in the uh, foundation Till they were tried. Then it couldn't be in the beginning because the cornerstone had to be laid. When Jesus came, there was no house <coughs> of the church. Yeah. There was the house of Israel. Yeah. But there was not the house of the church. Um, and that he couldn't he couldn't lay, he couldn't build that house until he laid himself a tried stone. Yeah. He was tried. God knew who he was placing as a cornerstone. He didn't guess about one of the angels being placed in the cornerstone. He chose his son, and his son was altogether tried. He knew his son was obedient. He knew his son would do his will. He knew his son would carry out his purpose. He was a tried stone. Then, then it said, um, uh, for a foundation of stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone. And he is precious. Jesus is precious. He isn't just a stone. He's a precious stone, a rare stone. Um, then he said, uh, a, a, a precious cornerstone, uh, a sure foundation. See, God had to have Christ as a, a cornerstone because he's a sure, he's a sure, he's not going to depart from the will of God. Nevertheless, Father, not my will, but thine be done. How many men would have said that? But he said that. He said, nevertheless, Father, not my will, but thine be done. So he was a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation, and, and he that believeth then, believeth that he's all these things, then he doesn't make haste. Um, he, he's not out of patience. He doesn't get upset. Uh, he trusts that cornerstone. He trusts that. Um, then uh, verse 17, let's take that while we have it. Judgment also will I lay to the line. The line of what? The line of Christ and the cornerstone and righteousness to the plummet, to the cornerstone. And the hail, the judgment, for uh, this is a 
prophecy concerning 70 AD that destroyed Israel, rebellious Israel, Israel that rejected Christ. He said uh, and that the hail shall sweep away the refuge of lies, and the waters shall um, uh, overflow the hiding place. <coughs> and Israel was hiding in Rome, <laughs> hiding under the power of Rome. Rome was the, mm -hmm. their lord. Um, they're, they're over, over them. Um, and they were they were a vassal nation. Um, but verse 18 said, and your covenant with death, that was their alignment with Rome, shall be disannulled, uh, made uh, no vo uh, avoid it, uh, wipe it out. And your agreement with hell shall not stand. Um, that was referring to the sinful, ungodly, unholy nation of Rome that uh, they had made a covenant with, an agreement with. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, then you shall be uh, trodden down by it. And they were in 70 AD. They were trodden down. And, um, and the Roman general Titus uh, poured uh, swine's blood upon the altar in, in the holy place and uh, in, in, in the holy of holies and took the last stone and tore it apart of the temple and they were vanquished as a nation. Uh, so this is the judgment of God that came upon them because they, they didn't regard this precious cornerstone. Um, Christ must be, now, now look back uh, in uh, verse uh, eight and nine of the 28th chapter of Isaiah also, uh, verse eight, for all tables, a table is a place where you take food from. Um, Jesus turned the tables uh, uh, upside down in the temple. When he cleansed the temple uh, twice, he did that. Uh, first and second cleansing, uh, which is a picture of the first and second advent of the coming of Christ. Um, there's two cleansings of the temple, the church, one back there and one up here. He cleansed the temple twice um, before his uh, advent, his going away, and his coming again, the church will be cleansed twice. There in the early rain and here in the latter rain because vomit is food that's been eaten but it becomes uh, poisonous to your body. Uh, false doctrine, you can eat it. You can consume it. Yes. Uh, you, you, millions of people do. Uh, but it, it, when it's regurgitated, it becomes an ugly word we use, vomit. Um, uh, it, it, it's you know, vomit, it's out of the body, but it was in the body, but it's now poisonous and cannot be good for the body. And Jesus, or that is the prophecy of Isaiah said, all tables are full of vomit. All the tables of Israel, all their teachings became vomit. They had eaten it, but it was poisonous in their system. They couldn't live by it. They desecrated the law of God instead of keeping it, and uh, it became vomit. In the eyes of God, it was vomit. Uh, Jesus and, and Isaiah said, all tables are full of vomit. That's false doctrine when a person eats it and then spews it out. Yes. And it's not a foundation teaching. It's not a foundation stone. It becomes of Christ. It becomes vomit. And it's sickening. It's uh, poisonous. Uh, false teaching, false prophets, false doctrine, uh, false interpretation. Uh, then he said, um, and, and there is no place clean. There was no place clean in Israel when Jesus came. No. Uh, the scripture said in the third chapter of Matthew, uh, the, fulfilling the prophecy, they which sat in darkness, they sat in darkness, saw a great light, and to them which sat in the region shadow. and the shadow of death, light was sprung up. He came as that light. 
you came as, as that uh, uh, antidote to their evil. And verse 9 said, Who shall he teach knowledge? <clears throat> See, I'm using verse 8 to prove verse 9, and verse 9 to prove verse 8, because he's referring here to a table, and he's referring to vomit, which is digestive food. Um, but in the ninth verse, he comes right back with the word knowledge. Yeah. See, iron sharpens iron. The scripture sharpens True. the scripture. Whom shall he teach knowledge? To whom shall he teach knowledge? Understanding. And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Doctrine <clears throat> is strong teaching of the apostles and Jesus Christ and revelations of Jesus Christ and the apostles and prophets that establishes the church in principle, establishes the church where everybody does not just start doing what they want to do, as they feel to do, and Mishnah sets in, they interpret uh, as they just desire to interpret. Um, and, and see, that that's the, whom shall he teach knowledge? And knowledge is one thing. But doctrine is another. Doctrine is not altogether, uh, uh, now let me get this right, uh, knowledge is not altogether doctrine. Um, but doctrine is knowledge. All doctrine is knowledge, but just knowledge alone is not altogether doctrine. You can have, you can have understanding that Christ is your Savior, He died on the cross for your sins, that's knowledge. You, that's knowledge you should have. That's knowledge that I should have. I should, uh, I should have that knowledge from the beginning. Um, that's knowledge. That's a, that's understanding of that part of the plan of God, the Scriptures. But that isn't the, yet all doctrine, because doctrine pertains to order, to government, to overcoming the flesh nature, overcoming the old man with lust, desire overcoming sin uh, and in your life, sanctifying what you to the Lord God, the order of the, of the ministry, just like the order of the priesthood, the order of the ministry. How does the, how does the ministry operate in the church? When should there be a prophet on his feet? When should there be an apostle? When should there be a teacher? When, 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 it, when should there be uh, someone to give out the word, to move the church from one place to another place, not of man, but of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Brother Wallace. Uh, it just kept stirring my mind those scriptures. Uh, Speak up now when they can hear you. Cor uh, vomit or corruption can set into knowledge. Yes. You know, uh, I thought back through the years when people write own knowledge, but because of drifting the the, the from away from that, from away from that, and it, they got corrupt, and it set right into their knowledge, and then they were completely out of the dark. <clears throat> There's a point in you and in me, and every teacher, every preacher, every Sunday school teacher, every preacher, every minister, <clears throat> including myself, that there's a point in it, and you as a child of God, that if you do not continue to move in the Spirit. And the spirit completely, always, you practice it, you sharpen your sword, uh, the word of God. Your, your sword is the word of God. Right. And you have that. That's part of your armament. Iron sharp. Uh, is that Ephesians 6, where it gives a complete armament of God? Uh, the uh, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the, having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Um, see, the, the complete armament of God for you as a soldier includes not only your breastplate to defend you, but your sword to be an offensive weapon. The sword is an offensive weapon as well as an offensive weapon. Uh, yeah, the Word of God is an offensive weapon to go against and, and, and go after Satan, his works, go after the flesh, go after the carnal mind, as well as to defend yourself against the enemy coming in like a flood. Uh, when, the, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard. And uh, so 
if you, there's a point in me, um, and you, and, and the children of God, if we don't continue to sharpen our sword, continue to check our breastplate, continue to see if the helmet is really there, continue to see if our feet are shot with the preparation of the gospel of peace, stagnation will set in. Stagnation. That is, you'll begin to err in your spirit, confusing it with God's commandment because there's a little thing called self-righteousness that will start setting in. And uh, it'll be justification of self rather than God's word pointing out what is true and what is error. So I must continually sharpen my sword. I must continually not forsake the assembly. I must continually put the breastplate on. I, I, I say that, that, that's, a, that's a must. That's a must. Because otherwise, uh, I, I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm moving away from the foundation, the tribe stone, the precious cornerstone, the sure foundation. And um, he said, uh, in, in uh, whom shall he teach the knowledge? Verse 9, Isaiah 28. And whom uh, shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk. Yeah. St. Peter said desire as babes, as babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. But but then there's a time when when I just can't continue to be a babe. I've got I've got at some point to turn loose. Uh, the breast to uh, be, be able to eat the meat, the meat of the word, doctrine, not not just the nourishment of the breast, the milk, uh, as sincere. He said, uh, he said, and get a little more of this. Whom shall I teach knowledge? Whom shall I make understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. Uh, see, uh, you're able then to take nourishment from the manna, from meat, from the manna, for the devil. Uh, I heard an old saying, uh, there was an old wagon wheel, it's got a lot of spokes in it. Right. The guy told me, he says, there's a lot to ways into heaven. I mean, each church got their own way to looking at it. I said, oh no, I <coughs> Surely not, not but one way, buddy. That's dangerous. I say, hey, I'm, the I'm, hug, but, I'm like you. But you're not, in the, you're not even in the a spoke. Yeah, this is not uh, a wagon wheel. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. It, it, it looks that way, but it's not. But it's not. I uh, believe this. I, I stand I, with you on that. I that, believe this. That's good. The reason why there's so many reveal of different denominations <clears throat> is they want something to suit their self. See? something that's easy because this old fire that's really burning when you want to get a taste of it you may backslide but that taste of what you once had you'll never forget and so this is what I'm saying that foundation when you want to get saved you'll try to hold on I don't care how much you stumble this man was talking about a while ago when you stumble there's always a way to Get somebody to help you crawl back. Get to get back to the Lord. Get stay in that place until you get a foundation settled. If you don't, if you don't, you'll just keep sliding. Uh, my father was a fisherman, a commercial fisherman, and he told us boys never leave port, never take one of the boats out without. I don't care what quality net you have. I don't care uh, what horsepower you have in that engine. He said see if there is a good anchor on the boat. He said, the most important thing you'll carry to the sea is a good anchor. And you have to have an anchor when you engage yourself in becoming and walking with Christ as a child of God in the community of the church, in the community of the saints. Because uh, as Brother Dale said, and I agree wholeheartedly, um, uh, yeah, a man told me some of that, Brother Dale. He said, heaven is like Philadelphia. He said, there's many roads to get into Philadelphia. You can come down Highway 87 or uh, Highway 64 or whatever, uh, getting out of the number of the highway, he said. But 
I, I said, no, no, that is true. I said, heaven is not Philadelphia. Uh, Jesus settled that in John 14. I am the way, but I am the way. So there's only one way, and there's only one precious cornerstone. There's only one sure foundation. And um, the thing is this, uh, if I'm a babe and I stay where I, I'm never weaned, and I, I want the breast which the milk comes from, the, the sincere milk of the Word of God, knowledge, but I'm never ready to go on to doctrine. I'm never ready to chew meat. I'm never ready to, and you know, um, I watch the congregation closely as a pastor, and I, I notice sometimes when God sends us someone diverse or someone with diversity, uh, we, we have a, an open pulpit. We have an open door here for people to uh, express Christ. And I notice when God sends a little different, um, someone with a different way of approaching a subject or even uh, to where we don't, we don't necessarily see it that way. And we, that's, our, that's our right to, to withhold, say, I accept that until it's proven by the Word of God. I have that right in God. If I keep the right spirit, if I love that person, if I pray for them, if, if I have patience with them, if I don't uh, try to uh, use perhaps the fact that they don't have a level of knowledge I may see someone else has, or I have a level of knowledge I feel I may have, but I don't, I don't cause them to lose their soul or to be weary in well-doing. Uh, that's called the pathway of charity. Read, read the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians and, and see, uh, though I speak with the tongue of men and of angels, and I, and, and I have not charity, I become as a tinkling brass and a sounding symbol. And you can see quickly, many times, uh, that people are not on the foundation, because if you're on the foundation, nothing will move you. Nothing will move you, because you know, that you can hear anything and it uh, just be an interpretation. It is an interpretation. And I, I speak, uh, and every person speaks, subject to uh, you as a listener, seeing if I'm speaking uh, by the word, on the word, iron sharpening iron. But at the same time, I also am commanded of God that charity uh, heareth all things, uh, uh, endureth all things, uh, charity loveth at all times. Yes, See, um, you know, I'm not getting all that in First Corinthians 13. Beareth all things, yeah. is kind. Yeah. All those attributes of charity, which uh, charity is the divine nature of Christ yes. in you. Charity is not salvation on me. Char no. Charity is not goodwill. I know we use that, uh, that's charity, you give to charity. No, that's not charity. Charity is the divine nature of Christ and the understanding of that nature through his word. And that nature then becomes your nature. That nature becomes your nature. Uh, you know, you have that nature in you because you are practicing charity. I don't get impatient. Charity is kind, is patient, bears all things. Uh, uh, you're all things and hope of all things. But see, uh, there, there's an order. And if we don't, and see, I put this church on that order when I came here 56 years ago. That's why this church grew like it did. That's why people came from all over the world. There's been thousands of people come through here in 56 years from countries out of the United States. Uh, people hear the uh, heard the gospel. Uh, we've had people come from Germany and sit through one service and, and get blessed of God, never to see them again. But they went away, uh, getting a blessing from God. Uh, South America, all across. This church has been a lighthouse because the congregation was taught charity and order with that charity. So we're going to teach that again. We're going to go back and repeat our, our first words. Uh, we're, we're, we're going to draw people away from the wean them from the milk. You know, I need to be weaned from just 
sincere milk of the Word of God. I need to, when I hear doctrine, I hear strong meat. Uh, maybe I'm not. You say, do you, have to, do you have to just see every point, everything, just like they would, or they see it just like you do? No, but I have to love them. I have to love them. They have to love me. We have to love one another. We have to let them feel nothing but the love of God in us in the order of the church. So here, I'll just a little bit more on this, and, and we'll and still open for comment. Um, see, he said, uh, verse 10, now here's what I was saying. The word of God must prove the word of God. Yes. For precept must be upon precept. Now this is an established order of interpreting the word of God. You, you give me a precept out of the word of God, but can you give me another precept to prove that? Yeah. Uh, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word is established. And you know we've gotten away from that order in the church the last few years, that people make precepts, but they don't have another precept. That's not biblical order. In the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word must be proved. Um, for precept must be upon precept. Well, what is the precept, the first precept resting on? It, it's the foundation. What does that first block of the wall rest on? It, 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 that, it, it starts with the cornerstone. And from the cornerstone, the block later, it lays it to the plummet and to the line. To the plummet and to the line. Those corners. They must be established. Yes. Watch Lynn Frost down here, uh, the uh, Frost block layer in yes. Sarasota, one of the better ones. And he lays that lays the cornerstone. And uh, cornerstone to cornerstone. Cornerstone to cornerstone. See, it must be precept upon precept. Word of God upon the Word of God. Word of God upon the Word of God. Word of God upon the Word of God. Until the wall is established that keeps sin out and righteousness in uh, the church. Uh, and he said precept must be upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. Now what does that mean? Because you have a five-fold ministry. See, here a little and there a little. It's, it's a hand, five fingers. Uh, it isn't just a thumb standing up there. Uh, I must use, uh, let's use it if I'm going too fast, slow me down, stop me, and you can comment or uh, ask a question. But in uh, Ephesians 4 and 11, he ascended upon high. Put that on the screen and get that. He ascended upon high, and he led Christ. He led captivity. The, 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 the earth that was in captivity to sin, yes. he led. When he had set it on high, finished his work on the cross, said it is finished, went to the grave, rose, and then ascended after 40 days and nights. He then, uh, he had set up on high, and he led captivity. He led captivity. Captive. They became captive to Christ and not the devil. He took them away from the devil. Jesus came and ransom yes. humanity out of hell, yes. out of, out of, out of yes. sin. Uh, his death on the cross did that. It is finished. He alone, he alone was the ransom note yes, that lifted the penalty of death from every human being. Yes. Uh, that did away with Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. But when you follow Christ, and he led captivity captive. He gave gifts unto men. And he, why did he, why did he give gifts unto men? Why, why didn't Christ just do it all? Why didn't Christ just stay here on the earth and just do what he did? Heal the sick, um, do the work. Uh, why didn't he do it? Because, because he had a divine order. It was precept upon precept. Even Christ must obey his law. Yes. Because his law is the law of the Father. And even Christ must be subject to the Father. So he couldn't establish a new law that the Father did not establish because he's subject to the Father. So uh, Christ then uh, had to then give to men. 
and he gave gifts unto men. He gave gifts unto <clears throat> men. And he gave, since it, it was a many membered body then, Christ was, was the sole inhabitant of the kingdom of God at one time. Yeah. He was the kingdom of God. He was the total person in the kingdom of God before he went to the cross. Yes. And at the cross, he was the sole inhabitant of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of Israel, the kingdom of the law, the kingdom of God. And he was the sole inhabitant. But then he led captivity captive. He laid precept <clears throat> upon precept, line upon line. And then it was here little, the apostle Peter on the day of Pentecost. God used him. And the eleven stood up with him. That was the, that, that was the beginning of, of that work. Okay, then when the, the eleven stood up with him, then here was um, the 13th chapter of Acts, and well, you know, the, the 7th chapter of Acts, and there was Stephen, the evangelist. That was another part of the hand, uh, the hand of God. Yes. Then, in the 13th chapter of Acts, here was the city of Antioch, the church in Antioch. And in Antioch, there were teachers and prophets, teachers and prophets. And among them was Paul and Barnabas and Silas, you know, and, and Mark. They, they were there. Yes. So he used, and in the 8th chapter, he used Philip the evangelist in the book of Acts. It was then the hand of God led captivity, 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 gave gifts unto men. So it, it, here little and there little, see that's the order that ought to be in the church now. That there be every one of these fivefold, the hand of God, the gifts of God working. It isn't right now. It isn't in its divine perfection, but it must be. It must come before the coming of Christ, that a New Testament assembly be where every one of those gifts can work in various times uh, as a servant of the body. The hand is a servant of the body. The ministry is a servant of the body. Yes. Okay? So, uh, Brother Wallace. Well, I just, uh, uh, I like that so much in John where it said, and said, no other foundation can any man lay than that was laid. Christ Jesus, the key, key uh, cornerstone. Yeah. And then uh, in John, just one more scripture, I think it's a six, isn't it? It said, uh, no, no, that's that one. I would say, oh, yeah. It said, one of them was, my doctrine is not mine, but the Father that sent me. Jesus said that. Yeah. yeah, Jesus said that in in that John six or seven, uh, I believe maybe. Well, look it up. We can run reference on it. My um, doctrine is not mine, Jesus said, but Him that sent me. That was hooked up to. He said, "The witness it is written in your law that the witness of two men is true." Yeah, that one too. He said, "It's written in your law that the witness of two, two men, men is true." Is true. He said, I am one that bears witness of myself, Sir. and my Father is the other. Father. Mm -hmm. See, Jesus confirmed Scripture by Scripture. That, that, that's very important. Oh, my. Yes. And you're going to be hearing a lot of me on this. Because I'm going to move this church back on the foundation. Completely on the foundation. That's my desire. That's my, now, it may cost me some years. It may cost me people that wonder where I'm going, uh, but but I, I assure you I won't do anything or move in any way outside of the scriptures. But the church must get back on the foundation. Uh, does the foundation please me? Or please you know? Because in, in Christ's law there's offenses. Uh, but we're not to be offended to where we run away from God. We're to want to draw near to God. See, if something offends me or my spirit, then examine why is it offending me? Why is that offending me? See, um, if, if we move the church in some order that we can trace back to the scriptures and iron will sharpen iron and there's witnesses, then 
why would that offend me in Christ for that to be? Whether it's doctrine, whether it's knowledge, whether it's worship, whether it's order, uh, whatever it would be, I should want to become perfected in Christ. <clears throat> uh, uh, Brother Leakwood, I don't want to anybody got a comment, go ahead. Uh, but uh, the the you said John, what other foundation six and, can that? 6 and 16. Is, 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 is that Corinthians where Paul said the uh, uh, other foundation can uh, yeah, that, no man I, lay? I, I thought it was uh, Hebrews. Uh, uh, yeah, that's that's First Corinthians 3 and 11. Yeah, okay, and then... For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, that that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. See, yeah. Isaiah established Christ. And Paul said there's no other foundation can be laid. He is the chief cornerstone. That's it. Okay. And then other that other one that I couldn't think of is the sixteenth verse of John seven in it. John, John 7, seven sixteen. All right, we have first Jesus, three, Jesus answered them and right, said John. Yeah. Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. <clears throat> Yes, that, that's, see, his doctrine was not his. He said, the words that I speak unto you, they're not my words, they're words of my Father. He, he spoke God's word to that generation, to that uh, people. It was God speaking through him, but he spoke God's words. Now, I want to jump in and, and uh, move this in, because time is, and we're going to continue to be in some area where we are, if the Lord wills as we go to heaven. <coughs> I want to encourage also in these these Bible studies. I want them to be so open that if some of you have two things, if some of you have a question or you have a point that you uh, the Lord has dealt with you in in an aspect of the Scripture or some other part of the I know among us privately we often exchange thoughts and words. I know Brother Richard uh, has been a great blessing to me, among uh, other brothers have been too, um, but um, in giving me points in scriptures, uh, how they see what you see in the end time prophecy concerning um, time dispensations, and we're wrestling with a lot of that right now. But I want, I want our study to be so deep and so intense that if there is a point or a question that will allow time to be taken at times for you to zero in on that and either propose it to us as to what we do with it in understanding or give your understanding God has dealt with you in and of course we'll use charity and that after a certain period of time of speaking that we speak subject to question um, you know as scripture teaches us to do but I'm hungry for truth. Oh, yeah. I want more truth. I, I want to see the church take a drastic turn right now. And if it doesn't, and you can hear this from a man 83 years old, 67 years in ministry, if it doesn't take a drastic turn, the church is in deep trouble. God's not in trouble. But what we term the church can be in deep trouble. It has historically been in trouble at times. And people, praying people, studious people, people who wanted the word of all things, uh, was the reason the church came from that trouble. And a remnant was preserved. And I have no question, the Bible teaches that, that regardless of what terms the church takes or doesn't, there's going to be a remnant. A remnant is a part of the whole. The remnant is not the whole. Eve was a remnant work out of the side of Adam. He only took one bone, the rib, and fashioned the woman. She was a remnant work. The bride of Christ, the overcomers, those that, that make up the bride of Christ, are, is going to be only a remnant, not the whole church. I don't teach, nor do I believe, or that you can show in the scripture 
that the whole church is collectively the bride of Christ, what we call the church, the ecclesia, the gathering together. Uh, uh, that couldn't be, uh, uh, with its imperfections and with its problems, with its issues, uh, it couldn't be, the whole thing couldn't be. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the remnant is going to come from the church. But, but so I'm hungry, and I'm hungry to, uh, and I, I look and see, and I'm an observer, that a lot of uh, diplomacy We've used that a lot through the last few years, what we call diplomacy. We've used um, soothing words. We've used, we've used um, at times um, what we call wisdom to try to help people to become more established and to stay and not leave, and not leave the church. That hasn't worked. There have been hundreds and thousands of people leave movement that God was dealing with their soul to come to God in and they made a start and they and they got so much but then because of flesh nature and because of false doctrine and because of men's practice rather than God's practice those people could not move on in that movement or that dispensation the honest hearted the pure hearted had to seek God they had to say where is God I want to find God and they, and they went on. Well, I, I believe that's the time that we're living in now. Yep. So the methods we've used has not, now even even the entertainment world, somebody said, well, look at the mega churches and look what they're doing. No, have you ever thought about the casualties that are in the mega churches? People that get left out, people who don't find that relationship with God, people that uh, by uh, the, the great numbers that wind up back in the world. See, sometimes we take ourselves apart when we have a casualty, but the entertainment world isn't doing it either because out of the thousands and thousands that come in the mass, there's still people hungry. They're seeking truth, more truth. They want more relationship with Christ. They want more honesty. They want more purity. They, 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 they desire, to, uh, pardon me, that they desire in the heart they're seeking, they're heart worshipers. Uh, they, uh, they, must, they that worship God must worship Him in, in spirit and in truth. So what I'm teaching here it goes along with all this, but in a short moments I have before the class ends and the choir comes in, uh, but um, here's where I want to go. Um, Hebrews 6. Uh, let's take a look at Hebrews 6 and get a, see this is dealing again with the foundation and I'm pretty well staying within my perimeter on that tonight and we're going to go deeper into the foundation. What is the foundation? Uh, what, what is the foundation? It's the, it's the, it's the soul um, truth that the church rests upon is the foundation and Christ is the chief cornerstone. Um, we know the apostles and prophets were put in to the foundation later, but they were not put in there in the beginning. The cornerstone had to be laid before the foundation of the apostles. I know Paul said in Ephesians, the second chapter, um, that you're no more strangers and foreigners and fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. But that, that didn't come till later. The cornerstone had to be there. So here in uh, uh, Hebrews 6, uh, no, but I want to get five. I have to use five. Uh, and l l let's look at five, uh, verse 12. For when for the time Paul said, this is verse 12 of chapter 5, for when for the time you ought to be teachers, you ought to be teachers. He just said that to the church. He said the time is you ought to be teachers. That was people sitting under Paul's ministry because Paul was a master builder. He said he was. I as a master builder have laid the foundation that every man take heed how he builds there upon 1 Corinthians 3rd chapter. Uh, he can build wood or he can build gold.
gold, silver, precious stones. You can build different things uh, on the foundation. Men do. The foundation is Christ. But now go on down. He said, uh, you have need that one teach you again, verse 12, which be the first principles of first principles. That's the beginning knowledge, beginning doctrine of the oracles of God, the That's laws it. of God. Yes, sir. And are become such mm -hmm. as have me of milk. They're not drawn from the breast. They're not weaned. And not of strong drink. Strong meat, brother. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful, unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. Now, that's where the mercy seat is established in the church. That as the mercy seat was in the Holy of Holies, so the mercy seat must be in the church. And when you see a babe on, uh, before the church, and they're using the word unskillfully, and the Holy Ghost shows you, not your judgment, but the Holy Spirit. And how do you discern between your judgment and the Holy Spirit? There's only one way. The Holy Spirit is full of love. Because the Holy Spirit is love. God is love. So when you're judging a babe, though you recognize it is a babe, because they're using the word unskillfully. Now you couldn't know that unless you have matured, unless you have become one that isn't using the word unskillfully. But you've matured. You become one that can have strong meat, strong doctrine. So therefore, when you see a babe, you know that's a babe. They're using, the, they're unskillful in the word of right. But you don't destroy that babe. No more than you would destroy a babe, you would see they were still nourishing the breast. Yes, so in the house of God, you don't destroy a babe because they're using the word unskillfully. They can't do any more than that so, if they're in that state. If I'm in that state, don't judge me because I'm using the word unskillfully. Pray for me that I'll grow, that I'll bow. Now, if you're, if the only way you can know that a babe is using that word unskillfully is because iron is not sharpening iron. The word of God is not proving the word of God. <clears throat> They're making disjointed statements that isn't based on scripture proving scripture. But you still love them. You still pray for them. You still know that one day they can grow up. They can become strong. They can become like you feel you are. Uh, it, so that, that, that order in the church lets us have patience, uh, bearing all things, hoping all things, enduring all things. See, that, that's a pathway of charity. So he said then, uh, for everyone who uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he's a babe. The strong meat, but strong meat, verse 14, belongeth to them that are of full age. Fathers. There's only three classes of people in the book of John. First John, fathers, young men, and children. Fathers, young men, and children. Have you have you read that yet? Uh, in in second John, uh, first John, the second chapter. If you care to tonight before you go to bed, read about fathers, young men, and and children. And children. And, and the attributes of each one. Because in the church, there's only those three classifications in God is fathers, full age, full age, perfected in the word. The word has perfected them. They, they're fully, they can use strong meat, strong doctrine, strong knowledge, uh, strong experiences. But strong meat belongs to them that are full age, even those who by reason of use, how did they get to be fathers? How did they get to be strong? Who by reason of use have their senses. What senses? Hearing, seeing, smelling, tasting, feeling. You have those naturally, don't you? Touch that. Sense of touch. I have all this hearing. 
five senses. Those five senses are then given to me in the Holy Ghost. Not after the natural sense, but after the hearing of the Word of God. And I have those five senses. So when I hear, I'm hearing in the Spirit. When I see, I'm seeing in the Spirit. When I taste, I'm tasting in the Spirit. I'm feeling in the Spirit. So all those five senses are working. Who by reason of use, use. Now if you sit in the church and you never use your senses, you know, you don't, and you don't attempt to discern anything. I mean, what, what is going on here? What's happening here? Uh, what's, you're not growing. You're not abounding. But if you're sitting there and you're using your senses and you're watching people uh, do this or do that or do the other, but they're not using their senses, they're not discerning, they're not smelling, they're not tasting, they're not feeling. They don't know the season in the church that's going on. So uh, they're not being perfected. But who, by reason of the use of their senses, now those senses don't leave you when you go shopping in Publix or, or Win Dixie. You know, I, I prefer the latter. But, uh, you know, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I just threw that in there. Uh, uh, but, you know, when, when, I, when I'm shopping, uh, I, can, I can shop naturally for food, naturally, still keep my five senses spiritual. I can drive a car and use my natural senses, will my spiritual senses be there too? Yeah. I can sit in a building <coughs> with people and they'll be singing, talking, ministering, preaching, uh, whatever's going on, and I can I can see naturally, hear naturally, but at the same time, my five senses are operating spiritually, and I know what's going on spiritually. So the foundation is where that, that we are established. Okay, now this coming, week we're going to be in hebrews 6 and 1 therefore leaving the principles of the doctrine of christ let us go on unto what perfection perfection let us go on unto perfection someone said the bible doesn't teach earthly perfection yes it does yes it does it teaches earthly fullness of God's work in your life. It teaches divine nature living in you while you're still in the mortal body. Uh, it teaches that. Anyone else before close? The, uh, it comes to my mind about uh, mm -hmm. a foundation is, is just a place where you start a building. And that's where you start your building at. Right. You come to a church where they've got a good foundation, that's the one you start building your house upon that. Then you can build. And, yeah. and Jesus, I, yeah. think, I don't I believe you used a parable about, about some built their house upon the sand, some built their house upon the rock. Remember that little song that said, uh, mm -hmm. those, those that uh, built their house upon the sand, it said the rain came down and the flood came up and the house fell flat. Well, and, and, on, and, and on, on the other hand, it was said uh, about the foundation and uh, the rock. It said when the rain came down, the blood came up, the house stood firm. Because it was on the foundation of the rock. You, yes, Brother Dale. You're right. I, I love that. I love that Remember picture. I love that picture. Um, I love that picture. If, if we could study in the days to come, we love to study. And I want to intermix it with the study of foundation yeah. and the, uh, uh, you know, I want to intermix it and the church moving back on the foundation. Uh, about a month ago or a month and a half ago, I gave you the thought, could, could we prove or show by scripture that we are living now in the very time dispensation of the sixth seal? Um, and uh, that um, the sixth seal has not been opened, but it is to be opened um, when uh, Joshua and his army marches around the walls of Jericho for the seventh day, and then they don't march around uh, once a day after that. On the seventh day, the sixth chapter of Joshua, yeah. they started marching seven times. Seven, yeah. 
they marched once. I believe that's Joshua 6, where they marched once for six days. But on the seventh day, and they did not blow the trumpets until the seventh day. Yes. And they did not blow the trumpets until the seventh time. Well, that is the beginning. The trumpets were blown, um, and they were blown seven times. And the walls fell down flat. And they captured the city of Ai. Uh, is that a picture? Can we consider that uh, as a picture? Uh, if we are living now, approaching the opening of the sixth seal, the sixth day, and in that day, we will march once, but in also in that day, the seventh seal is open simultaneously almost with the sixth seal. And I know in the past we put hundreds of years between the opening of the seals. But uh, just consider what I'm saying, stir up your mind, and uh, when that seventh day comes, immediately they march seven times. And if you read Revelation 7 and Revelation 8, and you're looking at it as the end of time, the coming judgment, the end of the world, the millennial reign of Christ, you see where immediately when that seventh day comes, that seventh seal, there are seven thunders, and there's seven vows, and there's seven trumpets, and then total destruction comes. Now just consider, if we're living now at the brink of that, and at any moment, if it's that close, the sea will be opened and those carriers sitting off Korea right now, loaded with those planes, that in a moment, in a day, or the missile that traveled 400 miles the other day, that North Korean leader fired, the longest they've been able to get one go, covered 400 miles, he's reaching to reach Los Angeles. Now this one went 400, the fathers just went. But what would happen if he has one developed that would reach the city of Los Angeles? I'm saying this to say to the church, I think we should be getting ready for the day of the Lord to come. And let's not be slothful. Let's keep studying, let's keep praying, let's keep attending, let's give up what we have to give up to follow the land, to follow the world. Because if you gain the whole world and lose your soul, what will it prove? And what will a man give in exchange for his soul? That the scripture asks that. So give up what you need to give up to get the word of God and to be prepared. Because I sure want to march with Joshua's men on that seventh day. I, I don't want to be caught uh, where I can't march and go around the city of Ai, the city of Babylon, and see the walls fall down flat. Thank you for being attentive. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being here. You've been a very good class, and I hope I haven't bored you. I hope I haven't monopolized the conversation too much, uh, but you've all been very good. And please pray, and please get in, and please be zealous, and uh, keep your uh, everybody, uh, everybody just become soldiers of the cross and let's keep the church strong. Let's keep it strong Amen. because the, uh, the, the church is founded upon the rock Amen. and the gates of hell shall not Amen. prevail against it. Amen. Well, God bless you. And everybody said, praise, praise, the, Lord. God. praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's pray for each other. Lift each other up. Help each other.